Hi, it's Tim Cole, and I want to talk to you today about the subject of worship. What a wonderful topic for us to ponder. Worship, of course, is, is about his worthship. It's about the one who's worthy. And if we just focus on him, we will find our hearts easily drawn into this place of true worship. But like so many things in life, there are obstacles to that worship. There are obstacles that might arise in our own hearts. There's obstacles in our understanding, in our minds. And I want to talk to you today about this interaction with Jesus, with the woman at the well in John chapter 4. He says some pretty amazing things here that are worthy of us to consider. So in John 4, we know that this woman was at the well and Jesus comes. His disciples go into town to get food. He encounters three obstacles with her as he begins to engage her, telling her he has living water that she could drink from. But instead of engaging her on those obstacles, he just brought a word of knowledge to her that that supernatural realm in the kingdom has the potential, the power to unlock people's hearts and get them out from behind those obstacles. And it did that for her. And she begins to ask this question about Jews and Samaritans and why the Jews insist that everyone has to worship in Jerusalem. And that question brings this response from Jesus about worship that I think is so powerful. He says, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while the Jews know all about him, for salvation comes from the Jews. That's verse 21 and 22, now in verse 23 of chapter 4. But the time is coming, indeed is, is here now, where true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father's looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. My first thought is that if we understand or we just take at, at first glance what Jesus says, that Father's looking for people who can have the capacity to worship him in spirit and in truth. There are two kind of elements from the heart of men that are engaging supernatural, the supernatural world. There are these two elements that are really important. It, it, it strikes me that we, we could maybe miss one or two of them, or one or both of them. It strikes me that it's possible that our worship may not be as powerful as it could, in its transforming process, because as we behold him, 2 Corinthians, we become like him because we, we, we look at him and from glory to glory, we're looking at him from glory to glory, it changes us. But more importantly, we, we miss the splendor of the one that we're worshiping. So it's, it's possible that as Jesus brings up these two elements, it's possible that we might be, we might be missing one of, or, or both of them or lacking in one or both of them. And so let's unpack this for a moment. Jesus said to this Samaritan woman who says, why is it that the Jews insist that we worship in Jerusalem? Of course, the his historical background is that God mandated that all worship and ceremonial and sacrificial worship was to be done in Jerusalem. And so the Jewish nation was strong in the truth. And Jesus said, even in this passage, that they know about the God that they worship. Unlike the Samaritans, they don't know much about the God they worship. It's interesting that really what the, what the Jews had and what they held on to was the truth. They held on to what was given them, the commandments and the ceremony. So much so that God in Isaiah chapter 2 said, I, I hate your new moons and your festivals and your feasts. And I just scratched my head because who was the one that instituted those? Oh, that's right. It was God. The ceremony and the ceremonial law and all the festivities that were wrapped up around it were instituted by God. But the reason God began to hate them is because Israel was drawn away and began to love the truth more than they loved the relationship that the truth was intended to bring them into. So we can find a security in truth that really is unrighteous. So there, there are those of us who we, we get around people who are really into worship and we kind of go, it ruffles our feathers and we're like, I don't want to be like that. That's kind of way out there. But I want to suggest to you that Jesus said the Father is actually looking for people who are not living in some kind of weird balance of truth and spirit, but are willing to take both 
in, into their lives and launch into worship from both of those places. And so Israel was full of truth, and yet I, it, I could argue that they lacked the spirit. I mean, just think for a moment, the one who was the Christ, which means the anointed one, anointed by who? The spirit of the living God. Why did they miss the one on whom the spirit was if they had the spirit? It's not that they never had the Spirit. That's not what I'm saying. I'm simply suggesting that they didn't have as much of the Spirit as they needed in order to come in that moment of time when Jesus was presented as Messiah and to embrace him. They missed him, largely. Missed him. And yet the other side is also true. You can, you can be so enamored and embracing of the Spirit, which in, in Jesus' words in John uh, chapter 3 to Nicodemus, he said, you got to be born again. It's like the wind. You can't tell where it started or where it ends. And it's this trust thing. It's out there. It's like beyond our natural comprehension. See, the thing about truth, we can get hung up on knowing right and wrong. It's the tree of knowledge of good and evil that actually brought sin into the world. But Jesus is the tree of life, and he is the truth. So if we, if we embrace the one who is worthy, we need to pull both the truth and spirit together. And what that does, let me finish the point before first. It's possible for us to be so spiritual that we have no pinnings, underpinnings, spiritual, supernatural um, truth pinnings that keep us anchored to the ground. And dear ones, Jesus says to this Samaritan woman, the father's looking for people who have the capacity and willingness to go after him in worship, both with truth and truth with spirit, in the truth, living in the life that's brought out of the truth, the principle that's in the truth that brings life, and out of the spirit that has no beginning or end. We don't know where it started and where it finished. I believe that Jesus is challenging us that there's a place that you and I as humans were intended to live in front of the throne of God that keeps us on the very edge of what we know. And that's so exciting to me. Oh, we can live in this place in worship to a God who's far more than we will ever, ever be able to map out in our own minds and hearts. This God who's so other than, we will spend eternity to worship him and we still won't know all of him. There's a place in worship where we're intended to live on the edge with truth and the spirit leaning into the unknown of a God who loves us and trusting in this single fact, not in what we know, but in who we know. And it's in that worship, that place of spirit and truth worship that we'll find him and discover the true meaning of life and worship. The only question, dear ones, is will you worship God in spirit and truth?